<laughs> <A grand, laughs> Grandmaster, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> Welcome to Bird to the Wise. I'm Dr. Jackie Berry. I'm here at Little Eagle Farm and I'm visiting Charlie Coop, who is a master falconer in New Berlin, New York. And I'm gonna to talk to him and his apprentices, Mike and Nikki, about the process of becoming a falconer under the New York State Falconry Association rules and regulations. There are also some federal laws that they have to adhere to. So why don't we go and pay attention to what Mike and Nikki and Charlie have to say. We've been living here for the last 30 years. I'm originally from downstate New York. Um, I have been a hunter for since I was 15 years old. And, wow. Um, uh, falconry was something that I kind of got a hold of uh, when I was about 17. Um, we raised two falcons, which uh, turned out to be two sparrow hawks at the time. Oh, okay. And we had learned how to raise those from uh, Dr. Heinz Mang, yep. who was doing the research on trying to save the peregrine falcon. Um, at that time, I wanted to try to get my license, but I couldn't. At yep. that time, everything was banned. So oh, um, okay. I finally found out about it uh, around 2005, and in 2006, I got my license, and Today I'm a master falcon. <laughs> that's excellent. That's quite the journey. Yep. Um, so that's good. Everything's kind of come full circle because you knew you were a hunter at heart when you were 15 years old. Yep. Okay. Yep. So um, if you were to give a piece of, of advice to someone who wanted to get into falconry, what would you, what would you tell them? What are the steps involved? Well, there's a lot of different steps. Um, you have to take a test and you have to have a, a good knowledge of uh, the raptors that we use. Okay. Um, so when you're an apprentice, you can only have red tails or, or, okay. or sparrow hawks, which are either falcons or, or uh, the budios, which mm -hmm. are the, uh, would, would be the, the red tails. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they each, each, birds, each type of bird reacts differently and hunts differently. So d depending on what you kind of hunting you want to do, it's just like somebody that is a, a gun hunter. Yeah. They select out which gun they want to go ahead and hunt with. Yeah. We do the same thing, only we use a different bird. So I'm here today with Nick and Mike, who are apprentices of Charlie. Unfortunately, Nick's bird is sick. She's not feeling very well. Do you want to tell us what happened with that? Um, I went out to the muse this morning and her weight's a little low. Um, I do believe once I get her weight back up, we'll, she'll act a lot better. Yep. Um, I will be taking her to the vet to have her checked out to see if make sure she, she doesn't have West Nile or mm -hmm. sour crop or any of the other diseases that they get. And then what happens, let's say, unfortunately, if she does have one of those diseases, how do um, they treat it? There is antibiotics to treat. It's okay. ivermectin we can give her. Yeah. Um, the problem with West Nile is it will can be treated, but it will never just go away. Oh, it's kind of like when humans get Lyme disease. Yep. It just sits in your body forever and ever. Yep. Okay. And what's her name? Her name is Scarlett. Scarlett, I hope you feel better. What birds is it that you use that someone would need to do research on before the test? Um, well, uh, when you take the test, you have to have a full gambit of all, a lot of the different birds that are um, that we use in falconry um, so that they have a recognition for them, sparrow hawks, peregrine okay. falcons, okay. red tail hawks, um, cooper's hawks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, jeer falcons. Kestrels are one of the few birds that have um, different color variations between the males and the females. And the feathering on the back of this one being that it has the stripes and the brown uh, that there indicates that she's a female. Uh, the males have, have gray patches on their back. She's only a few weeks old, and um, in a few more weeks, I'll be able to get her where she's um, eating grasshoppers and um, crickets, and uh, getting her to also eat mice, and, and once she's ready to do that, then I can go ahead and release her back to the wild. What is involved in the test? Is it mostly paper and pencil, or do they ask you to actually go out and demonstrate your skills with a bird? No, it's all it's all paper and pencil. Okay. Okay. After you take your 
uh, tests, you, they, they score your tests. You have 100 questions on the test. Okay. Out of that, you have to have an, at least an 80 on the test okay. in order to pass. The test was difficult. They, yeah. uh, I, hit, I hit print on the, the print, the study guide, yeah. and, and it printed out a book that was that thick. <laughs> and it said, it said, read and memorize this yeah. for the test. And I've been taking tests forever. And sure. You, you kind of gloss over and you know that they're going to hit on certain things, yeah, but yeah. they're going to gloss over others. And I'm glad that I took the time and I kept getting a little worried about it because I yeah. kept hearing it was a very difficult test. Yeah. And I kept worrying about it, so I'd read it over and over. And that darn test, it had the most obscure questions in the world in it. <laughs> <laughs> Those, really? They weren't kidding. You had to memorize that, that book. I mean, really, and, really. And it was crazy because they would come up with these uh, and these very strange names and, yeah. and Greek names for things. And I don't speak Greek. Right. <laughs> right. How many times are you allowed to take the test? As many times as you can. As many times as you can? It took me okay. three. It took you three? It took me three until I finally passed. Then you have to um, find somebody that's willing to be your sponsor. And mm -hmm. your sponsor is somebody that has to work with you for... A minimum of two years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then um, you and your sponsor work on putting together your facilities where you're going to house your bird then you have to get that inspected by the state okay and once the state comes in and, and inspects that then you can go ahead and you can trap a bird mm -hmm. beginning September 1st anytime from there until the end of January mm -hmm. and um, uh, depending on whether or not you want to try to get a kestrel or whether you want to get a red tail, mm -hmm. um, those are the birds that you're going to seek yeah. to, to try to get with your sponsor. Yeah. And um, then you take it from there. From there, the learning part of it actually does start to exist because now you're actually, you have a bird that you have caught from the wild yeah. and you have to work on tr getting that to trust you enough yeah. to just sit on your fist at first and then from there work on gradually getting it to fly to you yeah. and with most red tails and kestrels you can get them to start doing that yeah. and being able to free fly them in six to eight weeks. The most challenging thing I think is uh, uh, the first time that you release the bird yeah. to hunt. Yeah. And is, is she going to come back? Yeah. Did I do it right? And if you've done it right, you know, hopefully. But uh, uh, that was very challenging. And yeah. and I was always hoping that it would get easier. Yeah. But, but it doesn't. It doesn't you get know, easier. You constantly work. The first time you throw the bird in the, in the yeah. tree, she knows she's free. You know, there's no, there's no fooling right. the bird. She knows that she's free. She's got wings. Yeah, yeah. she's got wings. And, and you can tell by the way she's just looking at you. Yeah. She knows she's free. And the only reason why she comes back to me is because of the relationship that we've built. Right, right. And hopefully I've done that part right. Yeah. And so far, I've brought her back yeah. at the end of each hunting trip. Okay, so far. So that's been your favorite part? Yes. And your favorite part? favorite part yeah um bringing the bird home at the end of the day yeah <laughs> i mean we've been on with other falconers we've gone out hunting and yeah. watched the bird fly two three miles away we've had to chase them down yeah we've done all that but the good day of hunting is the day you bring that bird home back home with you Okay, so I'm so wrapped up in this test and whether or not I would pass a hundred question test. It's multiple choice, right? Yes. It is. Yep. It is multiple choice. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. No goodness. essays. <laughs> but in addition to the test, there's the um, procedure where you and your sponsor build the 8x8 eight eight Muse, was it called? Yep. And then New York State has to come in and inspect that. There's, yep. So there's a lot more to this than I think I and a lot of other people realized. So you got all that set up. Now you're ready to trap your first bird, yep. right? Okay. So you're going to trap your first hawk or kestrel. Um, what kind of trapping trapping procedures do you use? Well, we're allowed to use different nets like the dogazo yep. or um, the mist nets. Yep. Um, and we're also um, allowed to use uh, various different traps, yeah. um, whether they're um, uh, something like the, what they call a BC trap yep. or, or the goshawk trap. Yep. Um, BC trap um, helps, uh, will hold the bird there okay. and you have to be there when you're putting a BC trap out. Yeah. Um, the um, goshawk trap covers over the bird yeah. and, and holds it in an enclosure. Yeah, okay. Um, and that there, um, although you might have some injury with that bird, yeah. um, it's usually just no more than just a bump or a bruise on the, on the Siri, which yeah. is the, the uh, soft spot on the edge of the beak. But I do want to emphasize for anyone who's paying attention that these traps are 100% humane 
and in fact um, authorized by New York State and the federal government yep. as being the ones you should use. Yes, and, and if, if there are any injuries that do occur when trapping, when the trapping process is going on, yeah. then um, it is the falconer's responsibility to make sure that that bird gets whatever kind of medical care it, it needs in right. order to um, best be suited for the bird. What's Isabel's story? Well, they were both taken in 2016 from the wild as yeah. juveniles. Uh, they were same trap within a day or two of each other yep. and uh, right in the same location. So anything is possible. They could very well be related. But Isabel seems to be feeling okay. She, she is. Yep. She is. She's in very good shape. Yeah. Uh, she's very heavy right now. Okay. Uh, her normal flying weight would be 990 grams. Yeah. Uh, this morning she was at 1,085 yeah. grams. So she's considerably heavier yep. than what she would normally be if I was thinking about flying her. Mm -hmm. But being that it's in the middle of summer, you can see that she looks a little fuzzy. Uh, mm -hmm. She's in her molt. So mm -hmm. she's dropping feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is I want to keep her happy and healthy and heavy mm -hmm. and that way uh, uh, she's in the best possible health to drop feathers and to that the next uh, set of feathers are very solid and and they're very healthy so how many how many members are there in the new york state falconry association right now we have about 125 i believe it is mm -hmm. um, uh, there's only about 450 licensed falconers in the state. Mm -hmm. um, out of that, there's probably about 150 or so mm -hmm. um, that are master falconers. Um, there's a fair number of uh, falconers that are um, in the um, general falconry range. And mm -hmm. then there's usually um, somewhere around 70 or 80 mm -hmm. um, that are in the apprentice stage. There aren't a lot of women falconers, but in the last uh, couple of years, I have noticed that there is an increase in the number of women falconers. Okay. We don't define ourselves, you know, as uh, you know, men and women falconers. We're yeah. we're all falconers, all falconers. and yeah. um, that's another thing too that I like about our falconry association is that with our falconry association, whether it's uh, one of my apprentices or whether it's somebody else's apprentices yeah. um, or if it could be another master falconer yeah. nobody is afraid to ask anybody else questions about anything having to do with the birds we're all there with the same interest and we all are willing to share our interests and our yeah. experiences with each other yeah yeah I, I like that I like that it's open and everyone feels comfortable talking to everyone else because how else are you going to learn you know, and, and, and the spirit of it just seems very communal. Yep. So, so I do like that. What's been the most difficult part? Um, for me, it would be to maintain weights when you're, when you're younger. Yep. Well, when you first started out. Um, and then actually to figure out, okay, if I feed this animal X amount of food, it'll gain this much or lose this much or yeah. to maintain the per try to keep it as perfect as possible yeah it's very hard to do especially when you get like a real cold night and they they take up so much more right food yeah and they lose so much more weight yeah um, but over the year i've gotten over the years i've gotten a lot better at that oh yeah. um, what about you what do you think has been the most challenging part Everything is challenging. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's nothing's easy. It, there's there's nothing easy about the sport. Yeah. Um, it, it is. It's a constant. It's a constant. You you, you take uh, um, you keep track of everything you feed them, and what you feed them, the temperatures of the day, yeah, yeah. Uh, how the bird is reacting, and, and you keep a record of that to help guide you to yeah. find out that, that weight that you want to fly the bird at and yeah. where the bird is healthiest and happiest. So I just want to talk about falcons in particular and the main birds that you guys are, are using, which are Harris hawks, Cooper's hawks, um, red tails, and kestrels, yeah. and gyre falcons. Are, the gyre falcons. The gyre falcons. Yeah. Deer falcons. Yep. Still learning. Um, <laughs> are they? Um, are there a lot of differences between those types of birds in terms of personalities? Oh sure. Well, um, your your um, red tails and your Harris hawks. Um, they 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 grab their game 
and they hold, lock their talons and they hold on to it. Yeah. Um, and what they do is they grab a hold of the bunnies and they take it for a ride. Yeah. And the, then the bunny gets tired out and then they go ahead and they do what they have to in order to make sure that they secure their meal for the day. Right. Falcons are aerial assaulters. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, when 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 they're when they're pursuing game, they they want to have game that's mostly up in the air. Yeah. And what they do is they'll they don't have to necessarily um, grab a hold of it. Yeah. Um, although sometimes they do grab a hold of it, and while they're still in mid-flight, they'll go ahead and they'll bite the the neck. Okay. And with the way that their beaks are designed. It separates the, the vertebrae in the neck, and that there kills whatever game it is. Yep. But the other thing that they can do is they can go ahead and they can drop their talons. Yeah. Okay? And they do what we call racing through. Okay. Okay, now racing through is when they're on a dive, yep. also, when they drop the talons, they, they curl the front toes. Okay. When they curl the front toes, what they do is they actually try to aim for the back of the head. Mm -hmm. That there is the perfect shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when they hit the back of the head with the toes, mm -hmm. they, it causes the head on whatever game it is that they're going after to mm -hmm. drop. Mm -hmm. The talon, the helix talon, which is the big one on the back toe, that there goes through the back of the skull and splits it right, right wide open. Wow. So it's an instant kill. Yeah. Okay. And, they, and from there, the whatever bird it is that they're pursuing yeah. will just fall out of the sky and they can take their time, circle around and go ahead and feast on, right. The, right. on what they've uh, gotten. Yeah. If they don't do that, all that they have to do is actually just hit any part of the bird in the wing or any yeah. other part of the body. Yeah. And they're traveling at such high rates of speed, they're traveling at over 200 miles an hour. Yeah. So when they're traveling at over 200 miles an hour, just to go ahead and do that, it it doesn't hurt their feet at all to go ahead and go through that um, through any of the tissues. Yeah. But it will definitely maim whatever animals it is that's up in the sky. And yeah. And the the same process occurs. Yeah. That whatever it is falls out of the sky, they can go ahead and they can come back down, and then they can go ahead land on whatever prey it is that they're trying to get. Right. And then do the same thing, go for the neck. Yeah. separate or what they'll do is they'll tear at the throat and go for the jugular right. and get them to slowly bleed to death. This is Dusty. He's my uh, male Harris hawk. Uh, they're native to the southwest. Uh, Texas uh, over through Mexico and Arizona down into um, South America. Um, they're great rabbit hunters and also uh, enjoy going after quail. Uh, they're the only birds that are um, able to be flown as a group, so if I had four other people that wanted to go ahead and fly uh, birds together, um, then we could fly all of our Harris hawks at the same time. In the meantime, any of the other birds that we uh, hunt with for falconry, they all have to be flown individually, so after one bird is, does get any game, we have to put that bird away and uh, get, get another bird out. What training techniques do you use? Well, we, we, we have the birds, um, initially we, we start the birds just hopping to us. Okay. Okay. Or staying up on our fists. Then yeah. we get them to, to step over to us. Yeah. And then we work on increasing the distance. Well, as we increase the distance, when we're, when we're ready to free fly the birds, the birds have to come to us on command yeah. at a hundred yards. Okay. Okay. Um, and, um, do it on a steady, consistent basis. Yeah. And all of that is based on um, working with them, and you can tell whether or not they're, as you're going through, yeah. whether or not they're going to behave or whether or not they're not going to behave. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of their weight is too high or their weight's too low. Yeah, um, yeah. And that there is another thing that we also have to monitor once yeah. we get ready. Once I start getting ready for my season, yeah. I start working with my birds, putting them on the scales in August. Yeah. And um, I start weighing them every single day um, to make sure that they're at the proper weight for me to be able to go out and hunt with so that they're in, uh, so that I know what, whether or not they're going to be able to sustain the battles mm -hmm. or whether and if not 
whether or not I might have to get into a, a battle situation with them okay. um, sooner as opposed to later, whether or not I want to keep them closer or give them a little bit more room. What is the weight range that's appropriate for hunting? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very determinate on the bird itself. Okay. I mean, that is something that as a falconer, uh, that's one of the first things that we learn is weight management, mm -hmm. and it has to be the weight for that bird. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you talk to other falconers, and their birds fly at completely different ranges, range Ranges of 50, 60 grams, and yeah. their birds are fine. Yeah. My bird, uh, I noticed that at 975, if she's just below that, yeah. she stops paying attention to me. Okay. You know, she, she, she's just not as, as, as reactive to me. Yeah. And at over 990, again, she starts to just sit in the tree. Okay. And she's not as aggressive as I want her to be. Now, how do you graduate from being... Um, a general to a master falconer. You have to have a bird for a uh, minimum of two years, mm -hmm. and then you got to get three letters, one from your uh, sponsor and two from other either master or general falconers mm -hmm. to say that they have watched you hunt with your bird, you maintain your bird, mm -hmm. you've done everything, all the criteria you're supposed to, mm -hmm. and then they send it into the state, the mm -hmm. state proves it, they read everything over, and then they give you back, give you an upgrade. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I skipped a step. How do you go from being an apprentice to a general? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So both times you have to get three letters. That was, well, I think master's a little different, but uh, with a yeah. general, that's that's from a, an apprentice that's, to a general. Yeah. Um, that's how you get to from the uh, um, from the apprentice to the general. So you said the hunting season starts, you start weighing them in August, but it starts in September, September October. 1st? October. October. And then it goes until when? The, uh, March 31st. March 31st? Yep. Okay. Now, our, our season goes that long. Yeah. Okay. But there are most falconers I have come to find that once they start seeing um, bird or animals that their birds are capturing, yeah. um, like squirrels and rabbits and things of that sort, if they're showing signs that they're getting ready to have offspring, okay, then they go ahead and they they usually close up their season. Okay, so during that period from October to March 31st, how many times do you take it out um, to hunt? We try to get out as often as we Just, can. With okay, our so bird. there's no there's, set. There's no set number of days that you mm -hmm. have to get out, but I, I try to encourage um, my apprentices, and yeah. I, I also try to for myself to, to get out as often as I possibly can. Yeah. The more time that you spend with your bird, the more the better of a connection that you have with your bird. Yeah. And um, uh, that there just follows suit. Yeah. As time goes by, the the better understanding, you know. Um, it's kind of like when you watch Sunday's uh, football game, yeah. you know, the quarterback can tell somebody, go out and, and I'm going to throw you a pass over here. And they yeah. know exactly the spot to go to Yeah. Um, or which pattern to run. OK, but that's only because they've practiced it for so much. Yeah. What advice would you give to a brand new apprentice? Find a good sponsor. OK. Uh, talk to somebody. And, and I've been lucky enough to... Uh, I found Charlie Coop, yeah. um, and I've been talking to him since before I got the license. Make sure you have a lot, not a lot, but quite a bit of free time. Yeah. Um, this takes a lot yeah. to take care of a bird, to give them to come back to you when you call, yeah. and just to spend time with it. And have a wife that's actually nice enough to let you sit on the couch with her and watch TV with a bird on your face. With a bird on your face. <laughs> Well, I mean, you could have a dog on your lap, a bird on your face. I mean, yeah. you know, like, I don't see what the problem is here. Okay. It's, uh, it's a wonderful sport, and yeah. it's, uh, it's very stressful. But it's, it's, a it's, well worth worth, it. it's a worthwhile endeavor, and yeah. uh, it's, it, it always just has that, you know, excitement to it. Yeah. Uh, so I look forward to, to my next stage in the sport, uh, yeah. becoming a general falconer and, and learning more and working with more birds. And yeah. um, she's been fantastic. I, I adore her. Um, I, I adore the time we spend together. Um, but I'm still looking forward to that next bird to start over again. To start and to, over to again. Bring yeah. in that and to build that relationship again. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the excitement of the sport. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Anything? I'm looking to actually, if she, when she does get better this fall, I am going to probably turn this one loose and I'll probably start with a try of Coopers or something a little different. Okay. Something a little, little tougher. Mm-hmm. Because red tails are like the old, big old, uh, reliable pickup trucks. 
Mm-hmm. Nine times out of ten, they come back. Nine times out of ten, when they go into the brush to go after something, they don't break a wing, they don't get hurt. They're very robust, very strong animals. Mm-hmm. I kind of want to go to a cooper, something a little smaller. I can go around to farms and hunt pigeons and mm-hmm. smaller animals and sparrows. Yep, yeah. You know, something to make my life a little tougher, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, as if being a master or general falconer yeah. is not tough enough, right? Yeah. Thank you for watching today's episode of Bird to the Wise. We had a nice visit with Charlie Coop and his apprentices, Mike and Nikki, and we learned a lot about the New York State Falconry Association and all of the work they do to support people and their trapping of birds to become master, general, and apprentice falconers. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you want any more information, please go to the website, nysfa.org. Thank you.